Good morning. Welcome to the work uh, presentation. We're going to be looking at offshore investing. Um, just before we get started, my name is Stuart Lohman. I'm the managing editor of Biz News. Um, if you can show me, a, give me a show of hands if you can hear me and see Alec and the work. Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks, guys. And, and to the listeners, can you just, there's a little hand option, just raise your hand. I know it's a virtual hand, but if you just, if I see a few hand raises, then I know that you can hear and see us. Okay, there we go. Excellent. They're coming through. I'm um, just as we go through the presentation, one of the key things is to keep it interactive. So there's a little questions bar on the control panel on the right hand side. If you can just click that drop down menu and plot your questions in there, uh, Alec and myself will pass those onto the work team and we'll get them to answer as they as we go along. Um, but further ado, off to you. Over to you, Alec. Get things started. Thanks, Stu. Uh, we've got all the technicals behind us. It's uh, a warm welcome uh, to the sponsored broadcast uh, that's coming to you from uh, London, where I am, and uh, Cape Town, where the Warwick team are. Uh, from left to right, Sydney McKinnon. Uh, Sydney, oh, so uh, yeah. Uh, what do you look after at Warwick, Sydney? What do you call this? Sorry, uh, I don't know. What do you look after? What is your area? Thanks. I look after the fixed income side of the business, so it's fixed income and property. Uh, that's that's an asset manager. Okay, I must speak a little slower. I think when you're on a webinar. Sorry, Sydney. Um, Adrian uh, Adrian Miga is the head of. Um, so we've we've got we've got the Groot Canon in there as well. Adrian, your responsibility. Yeah, morning everybody. I'm the general manager of Warwick Asset Manager Asset Management. So you know, I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day management, portfolios, etc. And together with my asset management committee, we, we do strategy and portfolios. And then to your left in the blue suit, wearing royal blue like me, uh, at least we balance things out, don't we? Thomas Blamey, uh, you're a portfolio manager. Yes, hi everyone. Um, so I'm a portfolio manager and equity analyst. Okay, so there we have your team. Uh, we've got um, lots of people uh, who um, are into the hundreds now who are listening in. So please, guys, as Stuart said earlier, do try and get those questions in early. The idea is to try and get uh, through as many questions as possible. And uh, the team is here to, to take us through a short presentation. We've done a dry run already, so I know what's coming up. And I think you're going you're gonna to find it, it's, uh, it's quite a lot of fun. Um, but we do like to break in uh, all the uh, well from time to time and to uh, bring in those questions uh, when you have them ready. So there we go. I'll just get this uh, screen onto the screen, uh, get our pretty faces off. And Adrian, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Alec. Uh, today we just want to spend a little bit of time uh, chatting to to the listeners regarding offshore investing take you through a little bit more detail in terms of how you can, the reasons for going offshore. Thankfully, you're not only going to listen to me today. We have, uh, as introduced earlier, Sydney, who is a head of fixed income, and Thomas Blamey as a portfolio manager. So we're really going to do a situation whereby if there are questions, we're going to stop. We'll take those questions as they get uh, asked rather than us running through the presentation and doing that. So, so by all means, as those questions come through, Alec, feel free to ask us. We'll find that we might sort of deviate a little bit from the presentation, but I'm pretty sure by the end of this, sort of the next sort of 30 odd minutes or so, our, our listeners will have a, a much better understanding of how to invest and reasons to, to be investing offshore. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, start the presentation. So Alec, if we could move on to the first slide, please. Should be on the screen now. Yeah, we have it in front of us. Yeah, it was only, it was, yeah, 1997 was the first time that South Africa relaxed its, its exchange controls. And uh, we were allowed back then to invest sort of 200,000 Rand offshore, you had to get tax, uh, approval, et cetera, et cetera. And, subs and through the subsequent budgets, uh, we now sit where you can take 10 million Rand per registered individual over the age of 18. And that's per annum, which means that for all intents and purposes, exchange controls have been relaxed significantly. And on top of your uh, standard 10 million per taxpayer, 
you're entitled to take out a further 1 million rand. Now that 1 million rand, the advantage there is that you don't necessarily have to apply for tax clearance. So this does allow uh, investors to take a significant portion of their wealth offshore. And obviously the amount you want to take offshore is really dependent on your personal circumstances. We're not really going to be delving too much into the financial planning side of that in terms of how much you should take off in terms of your portfolio allocation. We really think that you should be engaging with your financial advisor on that. So Alec, if we could just move to the second slide, please. While, we, while we're moving on, uh, we want to talk around sort of four or five slides on the reasons that you wish to invest offshore. First one is diversification, and uh, I'm going to let Tom spend a little time talking to you around diversification. Yes, I think at the moment investing offshore is a very popular issue. Sorry, guys, won't you just bring the, bring the microphone a little closer to Thomas? It's, it's pretty muffled. I'll move closer to the microphone. Is that better? Yep. All right, so investing offshore is uh, quite a topical issue at the moment, especially in South Africa with a lot of the political uncertainty and political sh uh, shenanigans that's going on. But it's important to know that investing offshore is much more, uh, there's much more to it than just uh, political uncertainty. So we're going to run through, through, a, through a few of the things. And the first one being diversification. And the core to, to any sound investment strategy is also diversification. It's a great way to minimize risk. And if done properly, can also maximize or increase returns. So where we, when we look where we are today, we've got the structure of the JSC made up of about 164 shares. You've got the top 10 shares making up just over 50% of the index. We've got a very concentrated index. And if you look towards the top 40, they probably make up just over 80% of the index. Again, a very concentrated index. So as an investor, if you want exposure, as a South African investor, if you get exposure to the JSE only, you are subject to a lot of concentration risk. And sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, man. Uh, we're getting quite a lot of people saying they cannot hear you clearly. Uh, would you just get either get closer to the microphone or pull the microphone closer to you, if you don't mind? Yeah. Is that a bit better? I think that sounds a lot better. Thank you. Okay, as I was just saying, in today's world, um, it's, it's a lot easier to get a globally diversified portfolio. And that's something investors should defini definitely be taking advantage of. And when we look at our market locally, South African investors have exposure to the JSC, are getting exposure to about 164 shares. The top 10 shares of the index make up just over 50% of the index whereas the top 40 shares make up just over 80% of the index. So investors getting exposed to the, the JSC are subject to a lot of concentration risk. And it's, it's prudent as an investor to look offshore and have a, a globally diversified portfolio. So just as an example, on the JSC, if you wanted to get exposure to, let's say, the pharmaceutical industry, you've really got a choice of three shares, being Aspen, Adcock Ingram, and, and maybe Ascenders Health. Whereas if you look offshore, you can potentially go buy something like a Johnson & Johnson. It's a wonderfully run company, um, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, very cash flush. Now, this is a company that's products are used globally around the world. Um, I'm sure all the listeners or viewers know the products, they use them, they trust them, and most likely continue to use them in the future. If we just think in the last financial year, Johnson & Johnson spent about $9 billion on research and development. So given our currency, that's probably around about 120 to 130 billion Rand. They spent that on research and development. Now that is the, the, the size of Aspen. That's roughly the size of Aspen. So they're spending about an Aspen a year on, on just on research and development. So investors that only want exposure to the local market don't get don't get those opportunities. Don't get to participate in those opportunities. Another company like Apple, again, we don't have tech companies like that on our markets that exposes us to, to globally, um, global consumers like that. We do have a Nasdaq 
Nuspaz, who you can argue, plays in the tech space through, through some of its investments. But again, that's one company, makes up 20% of the index. It's a very concentrated bet. Um, so again, it's, it's a point of don't just look where you, you, you live or what country you're domiciled in. Look abroad. It's easier these days to, to diversify your portfolio offshore, and it's something that investors should definitely be doing. If we can just go on to the second slide, I think Sid is going to run us through to some of the geographical breakdowns there. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Thomas. Yeah, uh, Thomas, I, I hear your argument about concentration risk, and I think that's, that's quite important. Um, what we as South African investors need to do or change is really our mindset about being um, locally focused. We are really on a, on a global stage. And being on a global stage means that you have um, access to global markets. And I think the important thing here is that we've, for very long, we've been precluded. But as Adrian mentioned early on, since the relaxation of exchange con controls, markets have opened up to us. And I think it's important to realize, you know, and I think I saw in one of your articles uh, earlier this week, Alex talking about having a helicopter view. So, you know, get in the helicopter and look at the world um, geographically and the ability to invest. And I think, you know, unfortunately, or just by virtue of, of what has happened over the years, South Africa is still a very small player on the world stage. We less than 1% of the um, uh, stock markets as a, as a whole, or the world stock markets are, as a whole. So it's, it's really important that we take advantage of the opportunity that lies out there to get involved in other developed markets or even other emerging markets. You know, all markets are going through uh, different cycles as far as the uh, economic and, and growth cycles are concerned. So it's, it's really a, an opportunity for us to participate in, in cycles that are trending perhaps and um, uh, having the access to that. And I think it speaks to what you said earlier on, uh, Thomas, uh, having a geographical spread is once again uh, improving your diversification, and that, that's the basics of investing anyway, is to have good diversification to minimize your risk. So, okay. it's important. Okay. Yes. We've got a pile of questions, and I'm, I'm really worried that we aren't even going to make a dent in them yet. Um, so, All right. <laughs> just, just, to, <clears throat> excuse me, just to throw one at you, because I think this, this actually uh, falls within what both you and Tom have been saying so far. It comes from Zaniel Richards, He's, who says, do you think in the long term, after the political hoo-ha has settled in South Africa, that we will still need to rush offshore? Or should we always just have it in the back of our minds as part of a diversification strategy? Yeah, I think that's um, quite an important question. The political hoo-ha, it's quite nicely put. Now, that's going to be there for a while yet. I don't know exactly when that's going to settle. But uh, political hoo-ha you find uh, locally as well as abroad. I think we just have to uh, open our mind to the fact that um, uh, there is opportunity offshore. Um, and it's really a case of, of timing it and, and doing it at the right place at the right time. Now, if I had a crystal ball and I could time things exactly and tell you when to be more tilted offshore or less tilted offshore, then um, as I always tell my colleagues, I will be trading from my yacht in the Bahamas because I know everything. But unfortunately, I don't. So. Um, I think the question is important. Political um, risk will always be there in some form or the other. South Africa is a little bit more elevated at the moment than, uh, than normal, perhaps. But yes, when it does settle down, the opportunities are still there. And I think um, take advantage of it. The question here yeah, from Daphne Dave is we've sold a property in South Africa and invested it in a high interest bearing account for now. We've relocated to the UK and wish to invest the money here at some point. So it really gets to the nub of, of, of what this presentation is all about. She wants to know what are the options? Where, where does she even start to make her investments in, uh, in an offshore market? It would all depend. If the, if the funds are still based in South Africa, it depends if she has relinquished citizenship um, or if she is just uh, you know, a dual resident in both South Africa and the UK would, would determine what she can do. But there are many ways to get money in South Africa, out of South Africa legally. And we're going to touch on those a little bit later, but you can do asset swaps, you can do your foreign allowance, etc. 
where to actually invest that money in terms of um, where you want to, where you actually want to, to, to put it, should I be in equities, bonds, cash, that really is dependent on the risk profile of the underlying client. And really, in order to maximize that, they, they need to spend some time with their financial advisor, be that a South African based or a UK based advisor. And they will be able to give them guidance um, in, in terms of what allocation. But to keep money in South Africa, the risk you have is that over time, the RAND has devalued significantly against the dollar and will continue to do that. So it's quite a tricky one to get very specific on, on individual cases. But ultimately, clients who are in South Africa who need to get money out for investment purposes are able to, to do that. We go into the, into the ways to get money offshore. You did say uh, we're going to touch on that because, and, and I, I, I urge you, Adrian, to try and uh, keep it quite brief if you can. We will have the, uh, the presentation and the recording um, available for everyone afterwards. There are so many questions uh, that uh, you need to start. So quickly, so we'll be here all day otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've got lots of time, uh, but let's quickly run through. I'm going to touch on one and we'll just keep it between the three of us. It becomes less monotonous to hear one voice. The first one is, is an asset swap. Now, this is quite simply a RAND denominated uh, investment where a financial institution uses its balance sheet. You invest in RANDs, the money is then exported outside of South Africa into an investment, could be cash bonds or equities. The investment is always going to then be uh, repatriated back into South African RANDs, but you will get the benefit of a weakening RAND or the foreign growth in those particular assets. The one nice thing is that there's no limit to the amount that you as an individual can asset swap. However, you are limited in terms of the institution that is doing the asset swap, how much they can take off of their balance sheet. And then lastly, you don't have to apply for tax clearance, uh, which does make it a lot simpler to get that money offshore. Tom's just going to quickly touch on, on, on what a feeder fund is, uh, and then it's one of the second options to, to get offshore. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, a feeder fund, yeah, it's, it's just a local unit trust that, that invests most of its assets offshore. So, so at Warwick, we've got an international feeder fund um, that investors invest in it and RANs, and the, the local unit trust or Warwick International Feeder Fund, for example, will go and invest in the international funds abroad. So we've got a North American fund, a European fund, a global fund, an international fund, etc. So the investment for the investor is made in RANDs. Uh, they see the movements in RANDs, their returns or, loss or gains or losses are made in RANDs, and when that investment is redeemed, uh, they will receive their RANDs again. So that is all in, in local currency for the investor. And then the third one, as I said, I'll let uh, Sid just run through, which is your foreign uh, capital lines. I touched on it right in the beginning, and then Sid can just spend a little bit of time running through that way to invest. Yeah, I'll be very brief, but it's, it's really the ability for an individual who is 18 years or older to um, invest offshore, or take money offshore. So you've got your single discretionary allowance of 1 million a year, and then you've also got your 10 million investment allowance per year that you could use. And uh, this is before you need to go to SARS for uh, clearance in any form. But uh, if you want to go beyond that, then um, you need clearance from, from obviously, the, the, the from SARS. Now, um, you, if you invest, you can invest your funds physically offshore, um, your 10 million, and it doesn't always have to be repatriated if you, if you choose not to do so. So this, as, as Aidan and Thomas alluded to earlier on, is there's various ways and means that this can be done, either through going through a feeder fund locally or swapping it through an asset swap using a facility or just purely using your discretionary or investment allowance. Brilliant. Well done. Uh, Christina wants to know, there's a really good question here. What percentage of investments should we consider moving offshore if we're not planning to leave South Africa? I think it depends again on the client's individual risk profile and what they are attempting to achieve with their, their investments. Um, yeah. Adrian, you've got a, the, the, the sound's gone bad again. You just maybe need to bring that microphone closer. I'll bring my laptop and put on my lap shortly. Um, I hope that's better. 
if we if we look at what percentage you know, as a as a company you know we hold about 45 percent of our clients money offshore not always directly offshore but sometimes through asset swaps or through feeder funds but again it, it depends on the individual investor now if we back it up a, a little bit we go if we we're sitting in the uk now with you alec you know, no one would be questioning to only invest in the uk uk investors invest throughout the world taking advantage of the opportunities that are available because of companies that you can invest in the same applies to south africa the only difference is that our south african rand is significantly more volatile than the UK pound. Okay, it has been reasonably volatile now with Brexit and all the other fun in, that we've seen in the UK. But the RAND is where you see most of the volatility. So anything from, I suppose you go from 25 up, depending on what your objective is of those funds. Even if you're not looking to emigrate and you're just looking to hold wealth in a, in a foreign currency, then investing offshore and, and taking a greater percentage does become more feasible or, or something that the potential investor could look at doing. All right, good, good, good answer there. So somewhere from 25 to 45 is where you are at the moment. Uh, Philippe wanted to know, is it, uh, it is pretty easy to get money in and out of South Africa, but to move funds between investments that are offshore requires a permanent bank account offshore. Are there products that offer a one-off facility without requiring a permanent uh, bank account and I know this because trying to open a bank account in the UK uh, we spoiled in South Africa with the quality of the banks that we have. Most of the institutions you, know, you can send money directly from South Africa into a an investment platform where those funds can be held. The only problem you face is if you need to make a redemption then the funds have to come back into your South African bank account. Uh, without plugging any of the particular banks in South Africa, a lot of them do offer offshore bank accounts and there are other institutions, in, international institutions that will offer uh, banking where the uh, balances will differ uh, dependent on, on their particular rules. But I would, I would advise the client who is investing offshore to have a, uh, an offshore bank account because if you're traveling or if you, if you look to redeem that money, you may not necessarily want it in South Africa or you want to go from an investment in equities and maybe because of change in circumstance, you want to move that into fixed income or something else. You don't want to go from, the, from an offshore account to a South African account, apply for tax clearance and send it back out. You want to utilize that offshore bank account. So there are many institutions out there that will facilitate and allow you to open those banking accounts. No, good news. And, and uh, I know uh, I've been an Investec client for many, many years, and uh, Investec have got that facility. It's very, very easy in South Africa to open an Investec account because they've got a branch in the, in the UK. FNB, of course, are about to buy a big uh, branch over, a big uh, bank over here, Aldermore. So that's, that's uh, it, the practicalities if you don't have one could be difficult. Brian wanted to know, he said, can I get my pension fund to put more of my funds offshore? Uh, unfortunately, we are, we are restricted uh, prior to retirement with a South African pension in terms of the prudential guidelines. We are restricted to, to 25% in offshore plus another 5% into Africa. Uh, so unfortunately, that's not, uh, it might not be what the, what the individual investor wants. However, in terms of those guidelines, uh, we are unable to exceed that amount. However, they are able to take an extra amount offshore, being it with their voluntary or their, their discretionary funds. And therefore, when you look at your total wealth, you might be restricted on your pre-retirement money, but your post-retirement money or your uh, voluntary money, you then have no uh, restrictions on what you can take offshore. This is probably for you, Tom. Uh, it comes from Matthew Pellet, and he wants to know that given the majority of the Aussie 40 stocks are multinational businesses with exposure to foreign markets and economies, do you think we actually get more offshore exposure on our local market or through the JSC than we might be uh, considering that we do? Yes, uh, I think we definitely do get more offshore exposure than we do get exposure to to RAND or let's call it SA Inc shares or companies. Um, but again, the point of, of looking or one of the reasons to look offshore is not just 
to get offshore exposure for a weakening rand or, or for political reasons. So again, a company like a Facebook or a Google or an Apple, so some of those social media companies, we don't actually have access to those companies on our local market. We think 3D, 3D printing, robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, those industries we don't actually have exposure to locally. So although we might have offshore exposure through RAND hedge shares, um, and which will benefit when the RAND weakens, we actually also want to get exposure to the industries that are growing the quickest or, or potentially are the future industries um, that are going to provide profits down the line for, for investors. So, so again, it's, it's not just about going offshore for the sake of a weakening RAND or, or political issues in South Africa but greater opportunities on the offshore markets. I think there's a question on Twitter. Sorry, on sorry, Bitcoin. Yeah, there's Bitcoin, a question yeah. on opinion on Bitcoin. Uh, and um, as far as ETFs, uh, particularly that there are now ETFs becoming available on Bitcoin. And another que a question is from the same person uh, on uh, Old Mutual Precious Metals Fund. Could you give us a very quick uh, views on both of those? <laughs> just, on, just on Bitcoin, I mean, that's an interesting one. I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to give any advice on Bitcoin, but I think there's enormous opportunity for the underlying technology, um, the blockchain technology, which cryptocurrency in the end is, is going to be the winner down the line. That's something that remains to be seen. Um, but again, as I said, massive opportunities, I think, on the underlying technology. And yeah, you know, where Bitcoin is now, I think, there's a lot of emotions in it, a lot of um, sort of fear of missing out. So I'd be very wary of investing but in Bitcoin. But again, the, the underlying technology, I think, is, um, is going to be the winner over the longer term. If you're looking at a particular fund, uh, I think you said the old mutual um, precious metals. Uh, again, you've got to take a view on, on your view on where you see uh, resource counters around the world. Uh, now I wouldn't be overly keen to be investing 100% into a, a into a precious metals type fund. I would rather diversify. I would have some in resources. Um, there's, there's probably some opportunities going forward in resources, again, depending on the underlying um, mineral that they are, they are mining. But to be 100% invested in, in, in one particular uh, sector of the market does add an, ele an elevated level of risk, and it comes in from diversification. So even though you might diversificate, diversificate uh, at diversification across ge geographies, but if you're only buying mining companies across those geographies, you're not really diversifying. You want to try and end up with non-correlated assets. Certainly, you want to add? No. I totally, I, I normally tell my colleagues, I, if we go out for lunch, I only eat food that I understand. So I pretty much apply that philosophy in my investment uh, uh, thesis as well. I only invest in things that I understand. And I think we've reached the point with Bitcoin where there's so little understanding, yet so much investment. And it's a word of caution. We've seen it across the world with uh, bubbles happening in whether it's an IT bubble or a Tula bubble many years ago. Um, let's just apply that caution and, and get a measure of understanding what you're getting into before you do. Uh, investing is best when it's boring, eh? and I, I, I'm a bit like you too on that one. Uh, just bring me a biggie, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, what's it, steak and pop and we're away. Uh, there there lots of How about the costs involved in investing offshore? Um, yeah, costs, costs are relative. Um, if, you, if, if we look, there's always going to be numerous costs. You know, the, the cost of physically taking money offshore to go to SARS, apply for tax clearance, um, there, there's, no, there's, there's no cost there unless you're using some institution to apply on your behalf. They might charge you an admin fee. When you convert your RANDs into, into a foreign currency, the banks are going to charge a fee based on whatever their currency conversion is. And then when you invest, if you're doing it through a financial advisor, the financial advisor might charge you either time scales for giving advice or a fee depending on, on, on how their practice is set up. The underlying fund that you buy, the fund manager would have a, a fee for, for, for managing that, be it an ETF, 
um, or even at, even a, in a standard sort of long only uh, equity or, or, or fixed income type fund. So those those fees differ from from manager to manager. So if you're doing it yourself or going through an advisor, there are different fees in it. But often the advisor can uh, can create additional art performance because of expertise uh, if that's the way that you, you wish to, to invest. I don't think the fees offshore or investing offshore are prohibitive and therefore you shouldn't do it. It, it might just depend again on circumstance and how much you want to take offshore in terms of your overall investment strategy. It's changed a lot, hasn't it, over the years. When we first, uh, when it opened, the world opened to South Africa after 1994, the fees that were charged were incredibly high but there's a lot of competition so now it's it's market related i guess that just to add to what you had to say there adrian is just check what you're paying before you start paying it there's a really good question from uh, pietrus uh for sharon who says how do you handle the south african tax implications with offshore investments he goes to alan gray orbis he says and they provide me with a tax certificate for local reporting um, so, in, in an asset swap, ultimately, um, because the, the funds are South African and held offshore, uh, there, there potentially could be some capital gains issues in your feeder fund. Most of the offshore funds you invest in are, are roll-up funds, which means that they reinvest the interest and dividends, so you haven't got to worry too much about that. It's mostly a capital gain. Uh, or capital loss, depending on how you invest it. And then in your foreign uh, allowance, uh, your capital gain is really the, the growth in your, let's say it's a dollar denominated investment. So it would be the growth in, in dollar to dollar. But as your, as your viewer said, ultimately the institutions will send you a, a tax information, be it capital gains or otherwise, and then you are obliged in South Africa to report that. Most of those foreign institutions do not send the information directly to SARS, they send it to you. And then within your tax return, those different sectors that say, have you earned any foreign dividend, et cetera, uh, any capital gains, you would then note that on your tax return. And yes, you are obliged then to, to pay tax on your foreign investments because we are a, you know, a domicile-based uh, tax in, uh, country, so you're based in South Africa, your worldwide earnings, your worldwide assets are all taxed in South Africa and you're obliged to obviously report those through to SARS annually. All right, we're getting to the end of the uh, webinar for the day, so I'm going to try and uh, whip through as many questions as we can, guys. Maybe we'll push it out for another 10 minutes or so. Uh, here's a really good one from Kubis Van Eerden. He says, can a South African resident open a trading account in the US, stay with Ameritrade, and then transfer money overseas to trade there? Um, I think there are, if, if memory serves me, there are some issues with South Africans investing directly into, into the US. Um, but I'm more than happy if, if they want to email you and you email me directly, and I can get some more direct information and reply to that particular question. Because um, I, I, in the back of my mind, I, I, I recall some issues with us investing directly in the States. Most, most investors that we tend to deal with in South Africa go through Guernsey um, or into, into Luxembourg or, or, or even to uh, Ireland in terms of uses as opposed to investing directly in the States. Great. Corbis, if you just uh, drop me that line, Alec at Biz News. And in fact, if there are any more questions that we don't answer today for whatever reason, just send it to Alec at Biz News and I'll pass it on to the guys and we'll, we'll get uh, direct answers for you. Absolutely. We're happy to reply to all those. Super. Peter Boller wants to uh, ask, can you please talk about uh, probate estate duty issues with offshore monies? Okay. That's quite a lengthy one, so I'll, I'll give the synopsis. Uh, it really depends on how you have invested. Now, you can, as an individual investor, you can take your money offshore and then that would then form part of your estate. Uh, and then your estate would have to be, would wind up. So the question would be is, do you have a world for South African assets and a world for your worldwide assets, which could help solve on those problems? There are other ways to invest whereby you actually invest in an international endowment, or you could go via an international trust. 
And those are some of the ways that you can offset the issues of probate, whereby the endowment would change ownership from yourself to your spouse for argument's sake, or in terms of a trust, there might be beneficiaries that would continue after your death. Again, it's advisable to have the discussions with your financial advisor around which way to export the money or in what vehicle it should be housed, uh, should be held in terms of endowments, individual, do you want to go and buy an offshore pension? Uh, there, 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 there are numerous ways to do it, but probate is something that you need to be mindful of because the last thing you want is to send money offshore on your allowance, uh, they pass away and then those funds have to come back into South Africa uh, and there, there are all sorts of implications of that. Uh, thanks for highlighting that one. Paul Jeffries wants to know, what are the implications of paying dividends tax on offshore equities, especially in America? It seems that you get taxed again when it comes back to South Africa. Yeah, unfortunately you do because uh, a number of countries around the world have a dividend withholding tax like we see in South Africa. Um, and some of them would have some form of rebate facility whereby you could apply for your rebate back. We see that with some of the, the foreign denominated, for example, Richmond locally, uh, you can apply for the rebate. Again, it's each, each individual jurisdiction would have its particular rules. It's a question from, uh, another question from Matthew Pellet. He says, how difficult is it to get small and mid-cap exposure offshore and what are some of the best ways to go about gaining that type of exposure in your portfolio? Thank you, Matthew. Um, it just depends really which, which route to offshore you're going. So, for example, if you took money offshore directly and, and while you're in the offshore markets, you wanted to invest in some of the smaller or mid-cap shares directly, you, that, that could be possible. Another way is to, to go directly again, but to perhaps um, go through an ETF that, that covers a, a sort of like the South African mid-cap index, but maybe a mid-caps of, of the, the United States or, or Europe or the UK. Um, so those would probably be your best options. But again, it's always, you know, it's, are you, are, if you're investing offshore, you've got a choice. And there's, there's so many options you can go to, to get access to the various sectors be it in the US, be it in the UK, be it in Europe, be it within the, the, the Far East, Asia, etc. So again, uh, recommendation is to chat to your financial advisor around your risk profile because as you move into these different sectors, so, so they might have a high opportunity of return, but also your risk could then be elevated. And we see that if you invest in China, you can do really, really well, but you can see that stock market come off uh, significant amounts uh, as, as a risk and return plan. Yeah, it's called Bitcoin Light. Hmm. Uh, there's a question here from Roger Garside. He says, can the funds in a tax-free account be invested in an overseas feeder fund ETF? It's been a long time since I've been a financial planner, so I've got to like, rack my brain to check all these answers. Um, your tax-free account, there, there, there's a... Um, one of, the re one of the issues you have is that you can't invest in any funds that have performance fees. Uh, but I'm, I'm shooting a bit from the hip, so if I'm wrong, I will send a note out to you, Alec, and we can, we can double check it. Um, I think you can in, a, in, a, in, a, in the feeder fund because it's an SA domiciled fund uh, because the money does stay in South Africa. It's just the issue regarding um, the performance fees. As soon as a fund's got performance fees, it's not applicable to a tax-free savings account. But I think from the deep recesses of my, my memory, uh, we are able then to utilize the, the feeder type funds for tax-free accounts. But again, I can double check and let you know. Yeah, I, think, I think one needs to do that. Uh, Cornelia wants to know, could you touch on the hoops to jump through in order to invest in real estate in, say, Europe as a South African citizen? Sure, we, uh, we're getting slightly outside of our uh, area of expertise uh, as asset managers, but ultimately you would have to apply for clearance, you'd have to get those monies outside of South Africa. And again, you've got the questions of how are you buying that property? Is it bought in the name of a trust? Is it bought in an individual's name, etc.? Again, uh, expertise should be requested from um, from someone who, who really specialises in in physical offshore uh, uh, property. 
you know, to invest in offshore property through a listed fund. Yeah, you can do that. And um, certainly wants to touch on the list of entity companies. Yeah, I suppose the easiest way to get exposure besides actually um, uh, buying into physical properties through the listed space, and there are plenty of our uh, locally denominated funds that have uh, offshore exposure. And you know, similarly, our locally listed property funds um, have a large percentage of the holdings in um, companies who invest offshore. I think. You know, if memory serves me right, um, probably 10 or 15 years ago, as little as 10 or 15 percent was invested offshore in our listed property space. Now it's it's more than 60 percent. So, um, you know, a fair percentage of our locally uh, listed companies have the revenue coming from offshore. I think of the likes of Echo Polska, there's Hammerson, there's Capital and Counties. And also some of our bigger boys, such as Growth Points and uh, Redefine, who all have offshore exposure um, around the globe, largely concentrated in the in the European area and a bit in America as well. But that's probably the simplest and easiest way to get offshore real estate exposure. And obviously there are uh, there Tom, are special, what about sorry, you? Sorry, 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 Alex, just one second. Sorry, Alec. There are also specialist equity, specialist funds out there where you can buy some of the offshore real estate investment trusts, uh, where you're buying physical funds that hold direct offshore property, not through the JSC. So Alec, your question. Sorry. No, it's it's. it's I, I'm glad that you've taken it nice and broad because there are there two other JSC stocks into as one uh, Nepi is another who are 100% invested in offshore property. So it is a. Uh, there are many options rather than getting on a plane and trying to buy yourself a, a, a seaside flat in Croatia. Guys, we've come to the end, but uh, I think there's one last question that I'd like to take here from Ian Beck, and he says, returning to the foreign bank account question, can one simply open one when you need it? You can. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no problem to open up um, offshore bank accounts. As we touched on very briefly earlier, um, as a South African, you are, you are able to open up an offshore account um, through probably one of the simplest ways is to use one of the local banking institutions. You happen to mention one of them. There are many others that you can do it. Um, the hoops are not particularly onerous, um, simply because as long as you don't breach your exchange control rules, um, there's no problem to, to open those accounts and therefore own an investment and therefore report on it in terms of your local tax. Okay, we uh, just uh, there's a question, the point here from David Oliver who says, please, who are these guys who are we talking to? Obviously, David, you came in um, during the session. Uh, the, the three guys are Adrian Meager, who's the head of investment uh, investments at. Um, or the general manager of uh, Warwick Wealth in, uh, Asset Management, uh, Sydney McKinnon, who looks after fixed interest, and Thomas Blamey, who looks after, as you can hear, from equities. All right, last uh, question. Nice way to finish from Elmarie Veyers, and she says, please just recap why we actually need to invest offshore in the first place. Okay, well, very briefly, diversification, it's not only investing in African companies, it's investing in countries throughout the world, countries that are, companies that are earning their, their growth throughout North America, South America, Europe, Asia, etc. Uh, you want to do it from, from a geographic spread, you want to do it simply because we've seen the weakening trend of the RAND, and we know this is going to happen, and when you're trying to ensure that your assets are held in a, in a, in a, in a, in a stronger currency, be that dollars, pounds or euros, and then probably the opportunities that, that exist offshore in terms of artificial inter intelligence, and there is a, a much broader spread of companies that you can invest in uh, that you won't have access to in South Africa. We're not saying take everything offshore, but we are saying you should consider it, and not only because you're concerned about politics or a weakening rand, you really are looking for global investment opportunities so as to improve your returns and diversify away from just South Africa and the rand hedges in South Africa. Well, gents, thanks. That was a pretty comprehensive 45 minutes. Uh, maybe um, we'll, we'll uh, be back with this or other topics in future. There's lots of interest in this one in particular. And uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Uh, on behalf of Warwick Asset Manager, we would like to Alex, say thank you to you for, for hosting it. Um, 
Thank you to the listeners for, for participating in it. And if there are any questions that we may not have touched on, please send them through to Alec. Alec will forward them to us and then we will happily uh, reply to those. There might be one or two issues that we didn't really spend enough time on. Uh, we're happy to, to, to help and provide some more uh, information to, to your listeners. Thanks, Alec. Brilliant. And that email address is alec.com. Great. Thanks, guys. So I hope the weather in Cape Town is better than it is over here. I'm looking outside the window, and I think it's another minus day today. I have to just dress up warmly. Huh? There's no such thing as no. bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. Weather. Yeah, we've got some sun in Cape Town. If we can get some rain, we'll be ecstatic. Cheers, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.